Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon and evening for those joining from other time zones. We will be starting our webinar now. Welcome to this event, um, The Voices of Uyghur Camp Survivors, a conversation with Gulbakhar Jalilova, organized by the International Service for Human Rights and the World Uyghur Congress. Before starting our event, let me point out to some housekeeping elements. You may follow this conversation in English, French, or Uyghur by clicking on the interpretation button in your Zoom toolbar and then selecting your language channel. Please note that due to Zoom limitations, if you wish um, to listen in Uyghur, you have to click on Russian. And that interpretation from Uyghur to English will be consecutive. And for this reason may have a slight um, delay um, for other interpretations too. You may be sending us questions you would like to ask the panelists during the event through the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar. You may say, uh, send them in English, French, Spanish, Chinese, or Uyghur, and we will address those in the open Q&A during the last segment of today's event. You can also find um, live updates of today's discussion on Twitter at, um, at ISHR Global and at Uyghur Congress, and also tweet about it using the hashtag Uyghur Voices. You have to live halfway through, or if you'd like to share with someone else, we also got you covered. This event is being recorded and a recorded version will be shared at a later stage. My name is uh, Rafael Viana Davi, Asia Program Officer at the International Service for Human Rights. I am delighted to be moderating today's discussion with uh, three truly inspiring women. Our featured guest today, of course, is Gulbahar Jalilova, a Uyghur businesswoman of Kazakh nationality, Ms. Jalilova has been detained for 16 months in an internment camp in Urumqi between May 2017 and September 2018. And now in exile, she has very bravely decided um, to speak out about what she has gone through, despite the very high risks that this entails. Thank you so much for joining us today, Gulbahar Jalilova. I'm also extremely pleased to have with us Elizabeth Broderick, Chair Rapporteur of the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls, who is joining us from Australia. Welcome, Liz. And last but not least, we are joined by Zumratai Arkin, Program and Advocacy Manager at the World Uyghur Congress. Welcome. Now, it has been greatly reported that a wide range of credible first-hand evidence provided by victims and human rights organizations, together with reports from various UN human rights mechanisms, point to atrocities being committed against Uyghurs and Turkic people is what is known by the government of China as the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. This includes, of course, arbitrary detention in internment camps and forced labor facilities, torture, sexual violence, and forced sterilization, discriminatory mass surveillance, and widespread restrictions in culture and religious practice. Today's discussion looks at the reality of such violations, facing an estimate of over 1 million individuals through the very powerful testimony of one of them, um, that of Gulbahar Jalilova. We will start today's session with uh, some introductory remarks by Liz which will be followed by a discussion with Gulbahar and Zumratai, and lastly by an open Q&A segment. Now, without further ado, I would like to give you the floor, Elizabeth, for your introductory remarks. Thank you very much, Raphael and ISHR, for inviting me to take part in this event today. Um, I'm joining you from Sydney, Australia, um, and I'm sitting here on Aboriginal land, the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, one of over 500 Aboriginal um, tribes in Australia. And I start today by paying my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have nurtured this land for over 60,000 years. I also start by acknowledging the tremendous work that they've done in advocating for equality in my own country. Uh, as Raphael said, I'm the Chair Rapporteur of a UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. Our working group was established in 2010 and we were created from the efforts of many member states, but also civil society organizations, organizations which recognized that despite significant progress in 2010, discrimination against women and girls still persisted in every part of the world. So the working group to today, together with the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, we are the only two mandates amongst 44 special procedures mandates to focus on um, solely on women's rights. And that's despite the fact that half the world's population are women. Uh, our working group meets three times a year, usually in Geneva or New York. 
and the 31st session of our working group will convene later on this morning in Geneva. So apologies, but I will need to leave immediately after my introductory remarks to chair that particular session. Through our thematic reports, we bring visibility to critical issues impacting women's human rights globally. And indeed, our report to the Human Rights Council in 2019 focused on women deprived of liberty, which of course is a topic for our discussion today. Our report brought attention to the ways in which women are uniquely and disproportionately affected by deprivation of liberty because of structural discrimination throughout their life cycle. The right to liberty, liberty is a fundamental right widely recognized in international instruments. It's enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and of course in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Deprivation of liberty also concerns other fundamental rights, including the right to freedom of movement, personal integrity, privacy, health, work, education, and of course, freedom of assembly, association, expression, and religion or belief. The rights to equality and to freedom from discrimination and the equal rights of women and men also come into play. All these rights are inextricably interrelated. Deprivation of liberty has devastating consequences for women's lives. It puts them at risk of torture, of violence and abuse, unsafe and unsanitary conditions, lack of access to health services, and often further marginalization. It cuts women off from educational and economic opportunities, from their family and friends, and from the possibility of making their own choices and directing the course of their own lives as they see fit. Around the world, women are deprived of their liberty in many places and many contexts. They're confined in prisons, camps and detention facilities, in hospitals, psychiatric institutions and care homes, in workplaces, in private homes and in conflict and humanitarian settings. They're deprived of their liberty by the state, but also by community members, members of their own families, intimate partners, caregivers, employers, and criminal or armed groups. Deprivation of liberty is deeply gendered. While there are many forms of deprivation, they are all tied to causes rooted in discrimination against women. And this discrimination can take the form of harmful stereotypes, that seek to track women in subjugation or silence, that seek to punish them for perceived moral or sexual deviancy, or to smother them with overprotection. These stereotypes are far too often enshrined in national laws. And also women's deprivation of liberty is also frequently tied up with violence and conflict, and of course with poverty, be it through lack of resources or lack of opportunity. Such circumstances trap women, depriving them of choice and often putting them in situations that lead then to their confinement. Those risks are heightened for women who experience intersectional forms of discrimination, such as women from ra racial and ethnic minorities, sexual or gender minorities, women with disabilities, indigenous migrant or older women, and other marginalized women all of whom face additional layers of harmful and debilitating stereotypes. These women are more exposed to violence, conflict and economic unfreedom than other women. And it's not just the causes, but also the consequence of deprivation of liberty for women that is gendered because women experience their confinement in specific ways and are often at risk of heightened gender-based discrimination, stigma and violence. So whilst our thematic reports bring visibility to concerns impacting women across the globe, our mandate also enables us to bring visibility to women's human rights concern within countries 
through country visits and official communications, where we engage constructively with member states to address these concerns. Just to give you an idea, to date we've conducted 18 official country visits, although because of COVID, of course, there have been no visits over the last 12 months. We have sent over 535 communications addressing issues such as marital status and nationality, sexual and reproductive health and rights, adultery, women's human rights defenders, domestic workers, and also access to land. And we have engaged with the government of China on a number of occasions since our inception in 2010. The working group has sent four communications to China in the last 11 years, some jointly with other mandates, addressing a range of human rights issues relating to women and girls. The working group has received a response from the government to half of these communications. Our most recent communication related to Ms. Jal Jalilova, whose personal testimony you will hear today. That official communication was jointly sent to China by 10 special procedure mandate holders, including our working group. The special procedure system has been receiving an increasing number of submissions related to the human rights situation of Uyghur people, and the working group shares the concerns expressed by various mandate holders in this regard. In, official, in addition to our official UN communications, in 2013, the working group conducted a country visit to China with constructive engagement. But in our report on the country visit, we observed that we had received reports of dis discrimination against groups of ethnic minority women who had suffered multiple discrimination, both as women and as members of a minority group. The working group in that report noted concern of reports of unmarried Uyghur women as young as 16 years of age, being forced to participate in a labour transfer program from the autonomous region to urban factories in eastern China. They endured awful working conditions which had led to some families in the region arranging the marriages of their daughters to older men in order to escape transfer to the factories. The working group welcomes opportunities to continue to engage with the government of China to ensure the follow-up of our recommendations made on that country visit and also the communications. The working group also welcomes ongoing constructive dialogue with China and indeed all other member states to achieve our shared vision of gender equality. We've also been devoting particular attention to the situation of women's human rights defenders globally, because unique to working groups such as ours within the special procedures system is a convening capacity. Importantly, our convening capacity opens up space for women's human rights defenders at the international level to inform our working group of human rights violations impacting on women and girls in their regions. And as stressed by the working group in one of its reports to the Human Rights Council on political and public life, stigmatization, harassment, and outright attacks are used to silence and discredit women who are outspoken as leaders, as community workers, human rights defenders and politicians. Women defenders are often the target of gender specific violence, such as verbal abuse based on their sex, sexual abuse or rape. They may experience intimidation, attacks, death threats and even murder. Violence against women defenders is sometimes condoned or perpetrated by state actors. In a joint declaration, the working group emphasized that women's human rights defenders face unique challenges driven by deep-rooted discrimination and stereotypes about their appropriate role in society. Today's rising fundamentalism of all kinds and political populism, as well as unchecked authoritarian rule and uncontrolled greed for profit-making further fuels discrimination against women, intensifying the obstacles facing women's human rights defenders. 
those working on rights contested by fundamentalist groups, such as women's sexual and reproductive health and rights, and those denouncing the actions of extractive industries and businesses are at heightened risk of attacks and violence. What the working group has learnt over the last 10 years is that to eliminate discrimination against women and girls will require action from every one of us. It requires the consistent political will of states and it requires a supportive environment for women's human rights defenders. With the shared objective of progressing women's rights, it is a great pleasure today to be joined by each of you, so our audience, all of you who are interested in these issues, and of course, to be sharing the stage with Ms. Jalilova and also Ms. Arkin. Thank you both for your moving advocacy and thank you, Raphael, from ISHR for convening this important session. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks, Liz, and thank you for taking the time to join us today and for, of course, bringing in um, your expertise. Now, Liz, I think your remarks rightfully demonstrate um, how the impact of the operation of, of liberty is deeply gendered resulting, as you said, from intersecting forms of discrimination that disproportionately affect women of different ethnicities, for instance. They also remind us that fundamental human rights are rooted in international laws and standards applicable to all states and which, we must, which must be protected for all individuals without discrimination, including when they are deprived of their liberty. Yet this is very often um, not the case in practice. So I would now like to give the floor to you, um, Gulbahar, um, thank you so much for joining us today, and I would like to give you the floor so that you can share your story with us. normal <gülüyor> Hayat keçirvatatım. Bizim atı boğulurumuz mən üzəmə qazıq qalmıyor. Gülbahar da siz bir toxtab bir nimi qımısınız mən bunu... Gülbahar da siz toxtab durun. Siz rusçı ki almaştırmışsınız da ingilizçi çıxmaydı. Aslı dik til ne? Til bay yanı gödünüz mü? Karitli bay. Yox bu yanı. Zümrətay. Oh. Min anlatam siz biz tünügün değişken Rafael bilen ben konsekutif tercüm kamakçı bıraklam dört minut ne sözlü vesem ben onu yetiş bulamayım ya şunun için her bir bir kanca cümle muhta sözlü müsem ben onu tercüm kalışım gerek. Okay. Gülbaradı aldınız mı min mini? Siz her bir ni mu azrak azrak muhta demiştiniz o tercüm alıktı kini kaldı ki. Tamam oldu. Okay. Başlasanız buldum. Ben tülünü kılamadım. Sözler vereyim mi? Sözler vereyim. Ben Gülbahar Celilova. Kazakistan vatandaşı. Kazakistan buğrası. Ben adı boğulurum. Biz, biz Kazakistan'da doğulduk. Ben tüt balının anısı. Nor I am Gülbahar Celilova. I am from Kazakhstan. Uh, I had a very normal life. I was living in Kazakhstan for and uh, uh, involved in business for over 20 years. Dam kısınız buldu. Damlaştırsınız buldu.
On the 22nd of May 2017, on my trip to Urumqi, I was arrested from a Shu hotel, and then I was taken to a, to a police station. Now I'm like, I was arrested at uh, eight o'clock in the morning. I was arrested at eight o'clock in the morning and up until two o'clock in the police station, they only checked my mobile phone. They didn't ask me any questions. Then after two o'clock, I was taken to a basement. Then they started questioning me until 11 o'clock at night. And then they gave me this piece of paper, asked me to sign and it, which indicates that I am a terrorist. I requested that I need a, uh, an in, uh, interpreter who can translate the Chinese. And also uh, I need a lawyer, but that was being refused. After I requested that I, I must have an interpreter who can translate Chinese to uh, Uyghur because I only studied in Russian, I don't know any, any Chinese. Also, I said I, I, need, I need a lawyer. For that, um, they beat, beat me up, uh, even electrocuted me, and I was tortured, um, but I refused to sign the paper. I said, you can kill me but I will not sign the paper. And then uh, I was transferred to number three prison. On arrival, um, I was stripped naked and then changed into the yellow uniform. And also they did a, a urine test because the um, aim of this test was to check whether I was pregnant. If I had, was pregnant, they would, take, they would have uh, taken me to a hospital to, uh, to do abortion. That was the procedure. Um,
Due to the ordeal that I have been through during my detention in, in, in uh, the camp, uh, I suffered extreme, uh, extremely. And I, uh, when I left the uh, prison, um, I lost 20 kilo. And three days prior, three days prior, So prior to uh, three days before I was released, I was taken to a hospital um, because I was extremely weak. I couldn't even hardly can uh, walk. And therefore they treated me and uh, gave me vitamins. On the day I was released, uh, they um, had my hair colored and they did makeup and uh, uh, sent me to, uh, to uh, allowed me to go home. And uh, uh, then at that time also, they gave me a piece of paper uh, which has the contact numbers of the uh, Public Security Bureau. They said, we, you are a clever per uh, woman and you know what to do. You know you are not going to tell anyone about what you have seen, what you have experienced here. If you need our help, you can reach us anytime. Our phones open for 24 hours. Bishad'e toktap tutsak yani siz ki sorular kildo. Abazınız ne hazır üçlük dosyanız rahmet. Rafael, she's going to stop for now and then you can ask later your questions. Thank you very much, Sumbeta, and thank you very much, um, Gulbahar, for sharing for sharing this very strong and very compelling testimony. Um, I would like now to turn to you, Sumbeta, and to ask about your reactions, of course, to Gulbahar's testimony. Um, in light of, of Liz's introductory remarks to you, what are for you the most concerning human rights um, elements of, of Gulbahar's testimony? Um, um, in, in, in her story, she also describes how she went through a process of re-education to also in the camps. Um, and for you also, what is the objective behind political re-education in, in internment camps and how is this conducted in practice? Yes, um, thank you, uh, Rafael. Thank you uh, to Liz for her remarks as well. And most importantly, thank you, Gulbahar Jalilova for her, for your uh, testimony and brave uh, um, bravery. For me, I think the most concerning part was that she was arrested arbitrarily without any just cause or any fair judicial process. She wasn't even aware of the reason why she was being arrested and detained. Um, and the conditions of her detention are extremely worrying as well. The sleep deprivation, which is a form of torture, the physical torture during the interrogations, including the use of um, the tiger chair, the mental torture, the malnutrition, the unhygienic conditions, and her age. All of these elements combined constitute the worst conditions of detention, especially for innocent people. Even the criminals are protected from these kind of abuses and have human rights that must be respected, which are all enshrined in international and domestic law. The um, objective of these camps is very simple. It's to simply eradicate the Uyghur identity. The Chinese government is trying to re-educate and eliminate any um, extremist thoughts in line with the government's official goal of fighting the three evil forces, which are terrorism, extremism, and separatism. But the reality is that these people are arbitrarily detained for crimes they have never committed and treated in such deg degrading ways that they want to end their lives. This can be seen through the ways the teenies are treated, re-educated, and punished if they speak the Uyghur language or practice their religion. It is clear that these camps serve as a preventive measure and not a punitive measure, which means that people are being interned arbitrarily for crimes they have never actually committed. The other reality is that these crimes are often associated with simple religious and cultural behavior. We know that from official uh, document leaks, um, such as the China Cables, the Karakash list, and many others, they've shown that Uyghurs and other Turkic people are detained for the most basic expression of their culture and religious identity. This includes wearing the veil for women, having too many children, having traveled abroad, especially to Muslim majority countries. The re-education process has two dimensions the political and the ideological dimension and the ethno-cultural, linguistic and religious dimension. 
The goal is to instill absolute loyalty to the party, um, which is the Chinese Communist Party, and to inculcate its assimilationist vision of ethnic harmony while erasing any feelings of Uyghur and Muslim identity. This not only violates international law, but also domestic Chinese law. Even upon her release, these individuals upon release, these individuals continue to experience trauma because of the treatment that they have um, received in the camps. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sumritai. And, um, and in particular, when, when we're talking about this form of deprivation of liberty, um, Liz also had um, stressed how deeply gendered um, the, the, the consequences and the impact of um, such deprivation of liberty um, is and uh, precisely Gul Bahar, um, your testimony provides a very rare insight into the conditions of detention for women in internment camps in the Uyghur region. Um, would you be able to tell us a, a little bit more about the reality specifically for women detained in these camps? Um, Gülbar Adem de mikrofonunuz içersiniz. Um, Sizin soraydı işte şu lagirde boğan vaktimizde işte dikiş şarayet bulup mu bir ayalla boğan şarayetini tesirlep çıksınız işte üç minet başlı derek. Toktap durup şunu da ama tercüme alıp işte asarak. Ee, Zümrüt Ay beni anlayan bulsunuz, step koyan bulsunuz. Ben fakat toktamadım. Ee, ben bunu tercüme kılışım gerek. Um... Okey. Um, Azıb tercümeni kılasınız. Bek iştikte bir pit kaldınız. Bizde toktap toktap demişsiniz. Tercüme Allah kıyım buldu. Azıb tercüme buldu. Okey. Rahimada yükün gün. Ben kayt kayt yani dedim. Ben pa paranlışam aymen ki e, Gülbahar Hanım bilen bir vasıta anlamayı vatudum benim gibimle düşünün. O için siz özünüz kontrol kımızınız e, bir yada. Um, so, after one month uh, in detention, uh, we all developed lies and uh, the condition was, is, was one of horror. And uh, uh, during that period, uh, the, uh, my hair was shaven off, just like all the rest of the girls who were uh, detained in the in the in the, in the cell in that camp. And uh, we there was no water. We were not uh, given a, a proper hygiene uh, opportunities, and the food was extremely uh, terrible and uh, uh, torture. Um, a constant, uh, constant uh, degrading treatments. Um, every week, there were twice we, we had to take pills, which we didn't know what was they for. And we were injected once in 10 days. And we didn't know what was the injection, uh, what was the purpose of that, that injection. And every 10 days, we were also taken to 
now for to to check up uh, and we were stripped off in front of uh, male um, uh, police officers um, okay. I, I saw a girl between 14 years of age to 80 and Tarjimnakwasan uh, 14 to 80 years old uh, age range and uh, um it hurt me deeply when I saw these young uh, teenagers suffering from uh, such horror, uh, innocent teenagers, uh, as young as 14 years old, that uh, caused psychological torture for me. Uh, I felt terrible uh, on seeing them, uh, feeling, uh, fe experiencing su su such horror. And also, um, the, the women as, uh, as old as 80, 80, 80 years old, um, I was then, uh, after developing a heart problem, I was taken to a hospital, um, the prison, pri prison hospital. The place is extremely uh, terrifying. Uh, every time women were taken out and into a room where there is no camera and where they suffer uh, rape and uh, torture. Uh, no one could hear our screams and uh, um, it's extremely distressing to even to describe all that those experience. Gülbarada yana yana değdiren yapamı yapımız toktap toktap demiştik. As Every time I spoke in Uyghur because I didn't speak the Chinese and every time when they made order, I asked uh, people around me, girls around me uh, to explain what they said. And then after they hear uh, from the loudspeakers or, or we spoke Uyghur language and we were punished for weeks, they uh, deprived us uh, food. food in that way to punish us for speaking Uyghur language. Um, okay, he's gonna stop here for now. Thank you very much, um, Gulbahar. This is uh, a truly heartbreaking testimony. And uh, and of course, I cannot and we cannot thank you enough for your bravery in, in being able to share this, this with us today. So we're really deeply grateful for you. And also please feel free to take some time, of course, after sharing those, those very powerful words. Um, and and perhaps the, the most disconcerting element also of, of your testimony is that it's 
It's unfortunately an experience that is shared by, by many other Uyghur women. Um, and uh, it appears, of course, evident um, from this information that we've reached a, a worryingly grave threshold in, in the human rights violation targeting Uyghur, and in particular, Uyghur women. Um, this, of course, uh, requires us to address the very burning and fundamental question of what has, can, and perhaps more importantly, what should the international community and the UN do to that respect? Um, as, as Liz explained, the, the working group uh, she's chairing joined nine other um, UN independent human rights experts in sending a letter on, on Gulbahar's case to the Chinese government on February 10, um, in which they expressed deep concern about her, her arbitrary detention, um, gender-based violence and torture, but also that this, quote, violence combined with strategies to prevent inmates from cherishing and expressing their cultural identity including their language and religious practices lead to indoctrination and to forced assimilation of people, end of quote. Now, Sumdetai, what is um, for you the impact of this joint letter and, and what, um, from your perspective, can the UN system do to contribute to the documentation of grave violations in the Uyghur region to strengthen its monitoring and, and to push for accountability and, and for justice for victims? Um, yes, this letter um, for me, not only for me, but I think for the Uyghur community as a whole, but also for civil society, it's extremely important because um, not only it details, um, not only does it um, detail the horrible conditions inside the camps, but also this is the first joint letter on an individual case of Uyghur camp survivors. So this is extremely significant. Um, it's also valuable because it takes the conditions of detention and it puts it in the framework of international law and confirms the way in which the government of the People's of Republic of China is violating um, international norms and principles. So um, we, for us, it's important that you know, the UN continues to push um, for accountability measures um, and uh, this is what civil society working on China has been pushing for in the past few years. Um, so we believe that the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Michelle Bachelet, um, should exercise her independent mandate to investigate and report on the human rights violations in the Uyghur region. Um, and we know that she's been in, you know, trying to negotiate with the Chinese government since 2018 for a independent visit, visit to the country. But unfortunately, um, the Chinese government is unwilling to give access, um, unfettered access, because um, as, you, as you know, the Chinese government has been inviting foreign journalists and diplomats to only show one side of the story, which is their propaganda show um, to convince the world, the international community, that all is well, that Uyghur people are happily living in the Uyghur region, but this is not the case. Um, so it is very unlikely that the Chinese government will give access. So in that context, the High Commissioner's Office needs to reassess the situation and needs to look for other alternative routes, such as remote monitoring. The office has done it in the past on Venezuela, on, on Kashmir, on other um, countries and other uh, regions of the world. So um, the there is enough evidence outside. Um, there is the Uyghur diaspora has been, you know, sharing their personal stories. And if you meet any Uyghur in the world today, in the diaspora, you will know how pain, um, how much pain they're going through. There, we all have lost contact with our family members. Um, so there is enough ev evidence. We have camp survivors, brave camp survivors, including Gubahar Jalilova, and many others who have been uh, sharing their uh, stories. Um, with the international community. And there is a research, there is so much evidence outside that the high, we believe that the High Commissioner can uh, look into that route. Um, the UN Human Rights Council can also adopt a resolution to create a commission of inquiry to investigate the human rights violations um, in, in China, but specific, specifically in the Uyghur region. The, Uyghur, uh, the UN Human Rights Council can also appoint a special rapporteur specifically on China to monitor the human rights situation in the country as they have done with many other regions um, around the world. The UN General Assembly can also adopt a, um, an urgent resolution on the Uyghur crisis. 
the UN treaty bodies and special procedure mandate holders can continue to collect, assess, and report on the violations of human rights, as we've seen how valuable and important these are. UN member states can uh, continue to support accountability mechanisms at the UN level to hold China accountable. And um, lastly, the UN and its member states must continue to work closely with civil society to ensure that they are fully aware of the situation on the ground and they hear from firsthand witnesses, um, such as Ms. Jalilova here today and affected communities. Um, and once again, I reiterate that Uyghurs and Uyghur civil society groups cannot end this genocide alone. We need the UN more than ever to end this genocide. Thank you so much, um, Zumbrutain. I think your message today is extremely clear. We need the UN to step up its efforts to, to document and to report on, on what is happening in the Uyghur region. It is a, a question of principle, of, of humanity, both for the UN and for this all states committed to, to promoting, genuinely committed to promoting and advancing human rights globally. Now, before addressing questions that we have received through the Q&A, I would like to turn to you, Gulbahar, and to ask you a, a very simple question. Um, what message would you like to convey to the UN and to all countries committed to advancing human rights globally? Gilbara, this is an Arke Kulan Sual, Sizan Mushu Bediti Harap, Sizan Kais Kandak Shlan Kutsis, Bediti Nimshan Kusun Sizan Sashun Tasilam. I would like to ask you, ask the UN to um, investigate what is happening in the in the in the in in, in the Uyghur, Uyghur region, and uh, um, carry out a court uh, legal uh, legal legal case against against China, and also. Um, uh, have more media reports, involve more media reports to um, reveal what is happening, the reality of what is happening to the Uyghur people. Media thinking and Kalan Kaistel of Drongsbati. Was she and the Kaistel of Drongsbati? Uh, we would like the UN to guarantee the freedom of the Uyghur people, our, uh, the people living in, in, in the Uyghur region, and uh, stop this uh, ethnic cleansing and the genocide against the Uyghurs. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, we want uh, UN to hold China accountable. We would like to see the, the, the Chinese official to be, uh, to be tried in court. Okay. So my, 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 my last comments about especially the now the Chinese government is saying that we all lying, they have no, done nothing wrong. But uh, these are the papers that is uh, they have their own stamps here. And they, they uh, that is a key, the, the paper shows that I was accused of a terrorist. 
And also there are letters that I received from many other human rights and uh, uh, groups who um, at the time uh, declared that they would help me. So all these, uh, I can um, say that they, these are the proofs that we have and that they cannot discredit us by simply saying that we are lying. We are not lying. We are telling the truth. Well, it has been four years now since 2017, the killing, the ethnic cleansing, the, the, the genocide has been taking place. Over four years, if no one uh, tried to stop the, what is happening and uh, the Uyghurs will be, will, will be eliminated, eliminated. And at the moment, we, we, I, I know there are many, uh, many young people uh, being killed um, silently. And even the, the babies, the children are prevented being born or uh, aborted. Um, so all these crimes against humanity should be stopped. Thank Thank you very much for Gulbahar for this reminder to, to all of us, to, to of course to the United Nations, to states that, that constitute the United Nations, but also to all us um, committed citizens to, to, to ensure that we can also um, promote and protect the rights of, of people all around the globe and in particular with um, bigger brothers and sisters. Um, now we have uh, received a couple of questions um, in the Q and A um, in the Q and A section. Uh, the first one that I'd like to address very briefly. Um, before wrapping up is, um, Zumrita, you've uh, laid out possible um, paths of change or um, um, possibilities for the UN to take action. Now, the reality, of course, is that um, we are talking about a very powerful player here, which is China, um, and that there is um, documented also increasing pressure from the Chinese government on other governments and the United Nations um, to um, deflect criticism and to um, in any um, accountability efforts. Um, so do you think, what would it take for the United Nations um, to uh, resist this pressure and to um, push for a greater accountability? Um, I think it's very simple. The UN was created to, you know, after Second World War, um, after we have witnessed so many atrocities to prevent from, you know, prevent the world from uh, committing the same uh, mistakes. So the UN really needs to um, reflect on, on its past, on its core principles and um, really do its job because this is within the UN's uh, you know, own uh, responsibilities. And we believe that if they cannot do this in front of a powerful player, that, then that means that they're not even respecting their own principles and uh, mission. Um, they cannot be choosing which conflict, uh, in which conflict they intervene and um, in others they do not. Um, one human rights abuse somewhere, you know, should, anywhere um, around the world that is happening, the UN must do something because this is why the UN exists. Um, the UN needs to have the political will to intervene in such um, you know, urgent situations because people, individual people um, and communities are affected. Um, and I'm sitting here as you know, a member of this community with lost relatives, missing detained relatives. And it's painful as an activist uh, working with the UN system to see how slowly it's it's uh, you know working and to just lose your relatives just like this it's extremely painful and this is you know our stories um, we've been telling our stories for for years now and uh, we are our situation is deteriorating day by day so it really is up to you know um, the mechan the UN mechanisms to really um, 
not be scared or intimidated by any powerful player and to do its job no matter what it takes to protect human rights, to protect human beings. Um, and it's also part of, you know, uh, member states. Member states play a huge role by supporting initiatives and by pressuring uh, the UN to do its job. So I really think that it is time, it is high time that the UN does something meaningful to address the Uyghur crisis. Thank you very much, Sambitai. And um, I have a follow-up question also that um, we have also received from the chat. So it's very clear also from, from your words um, that principles, the principle cannot exist without concrete action and, and, and genuine commitment to turn it into reality. And now we, of course, we're facing a situation um, where we have a human rights council where China is a sitting member and a very influent member. Um, we also have um, China chairing um, or being uh, taking active part in other um, UN human rights mechanisms. Um, and therefore, there is a lot of effort put into, of course, blocking any initiative that would uh, seek to document report on the situation um, in the Uyghur region. Um, and of course, that um, China does not recognize, uh, has not ratified the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court and has a veto at the UN Security Council. Now, how do we deal, do we deal with the situation and who in the UN right now would be most fit, perhaps, to advance um, uh, to advance documentation, um, remote um, or public uh, reporting on the issue. Um, yeah, of course, like there are so many challenges that comes with, uh, you know, working with the UN system and because of China sitting on the Human Rights Council. Um, but I think, you know, anything comes with challenges and I don't think that this should stop um, the UN or anyone from holding the perpetrators and the oppressors accountable. Um, I think the human rights, um, I think the, the um, office of the uh, human rights commissioner, um, high commissioner needs to do better. Um, I know there have been uh, private conversations with the Chinese government, but there needs to be public conversations as well. And she also has the mandate to report uh, documents um, on the on the evidence and you know all of the human rights violations happening. So I believe that she has a bigger role to play. Um, and because anything coming from her office is extremely valuable and the international community fo will follow this. Um, and she has this independent mandate. So I think that she should use it uh, for a greater good, which is to stop um, you know, these atrocities from, uh, from going further because um, it's already as um, really bad as it is, we're facing a genocide. And so we, we are talking, I mean, Gulbahar Jadilova here, she has testified about, you know, forced sterilization, the, the abuses in the camps, but also outside the camps, which is worth noting that, you know, these abuses don't, don't only happen in, inside the camps, but also life outside the camps isn't very bright because the whole region has become, has been transferred into an open air prison where every um, basic um, tenets of your identity is being criminalized. So um, the Office of the um, High Commissioner has a bigger role to play. And I think member states should encourage um, the office to do better and to do more and more openly. Thank you very much, um, Sumdetai. And we're um, about an hour, so we're going to wrap up. But just before wrapping up, I would just like to give the floor to Gul Bahar for any final remarks that you would like to give us, um, also attendees and, and um, us here in the panel. So the floor is yours. Um, I will just translate that. But just before that, I saw something in the Q&A chat that someone asked, um, Eleanor uh, Openshell asked if uh, Gil Bahar was detained in Kazakhstan. Uh, maybe she missed the, uh, the, the beginning, but she was not detained in Kazakhstan. She was detained in the Uyghur region once, um, but she is from uh, Kazakh nationality. So she was traveling from Kazakhstan to the Uyghur region for business matters. And she was detained once uh, she was in the Uyghur region. So just to clarify that. Gil Bahar, I'm going to ask you to ask you
my my last words what i would like to ask from the un and the countries like us canada and other free countries they must unite it to put pressure on china uh my in my life all i want to ask is the freedom of my people of 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 people who are suffering under the the, the chinese regime so please help Thank you very much, very much, um, Gulbahar. Um, with this, I think we are wrapping up our conversation today. I would like to thank, of course, everybody, but in particular you, Gulbahar, for your bravery. Um, your voice is not only yours, but is that of, of thousands of other Uyghur women who cannot speak out. And for this, we're deeply grateful. Um, we're deeply grateful that you could share this story with us today. Uh, On behalf of the organizers, I would also like to thank everybody for tuning in today and to remind that we'll be sharing a recorded version of this event soon. Um, good afternoon, good evening, and goodbye. Thank you.